Dr. Carla Turner. Thank you. Can anybody see me out there? <laughs> I need a coat carton, somebody to stand on here. <laughs> All right, how about sound? Are we okay on that? Well, well for, before we get started, and someday my eyes will actually get used to this and I can see who you are out there. I just want to mention something. I, I haven't been able to sit in on many of the presentations so far because I've been working out front. And I don't know if anybody has made a big to-do yet over the fact that this is the seventh Ozark UFO conference. Has everybody already celebrated that and I missed it? <laughs> well, this is the sixth one that my husband and I have been to, and uh, I really want to thank Lou Farish for one more excellent weekend, if I survive it, that is. And, uh, I, you know, Lou really makes it feel very natural and effortless and so easy to be here, but I think Lou would agree with me that that's probably an illusion. Um, I think it takes hours and hours and weeks of work on his part for us to come here like we do every year and listen and share and catch up with all our old friends and for me at least meet a lot of new ones and all the while we're getting you know so much of the recent information in this field from some of the most committed researchers and reporters and investigators out here although maybe I shouldn't say committed um, <laughs> maybe I should say dedicated instead <laughs> I don't think any of them have been, have been committed lately, and let's just hope it stays that way. Um, I'll tell you, though, with all the apprehensions, I, I hate to get serious on Saturday morning, but with all the apprehensions I have heard voiced in the UFO community and other communities over the past year about all the escalating social and political and scientific and religious repression and suspicion, and polarization, and even fears of some new incarnation of totalitarianism, though, you sort of have to wonder just how long we're all going to be able to continue to do what we're doing this weekend and to research and report and educate ourselves and others about the real nature of this phenomenon. So let's all take advantage of it while we have the opportunity here. Many of us um, attend a number of these conferences and I think we read a lot of the relevant books in the magazines and journals and we have a great network uh, of friends and connections all over the country, all over the world in fact, with whom we share information and I just want to say no matter what our differing views may be about the ultimate nature of this phenomenon, I think we all must agree we're living in a very exciting world and a very exciting time. We all feel this, the more involved we are in the field, the more deeply we feel this, but the truth is that the rest of the world isn't watching what we're doing. I would remind us all that the UFO community is very small. It's very isolated from mainstream society in a certain way, although we're all out there right in the middle of things individually. And the things that we take for granted, most of society takes for science fiction, our fantasy, our hoax. And they pay very little conscious attention to us. Now, the reality of this phenomenon is not part of their perceptions for the most part, and until it is, I, I feel that we have a strong obligation to try to do something about that. As an abductee and a family of abductees, I know that it's real, what we're dealing with. As a researcher and a reporter about other people's experiences, I know that it is widespread, and that more and more people every day are becoming aware of just how real and pervasive and globally important this agenda of improbable contact and intrusion must surely be. I think the nature of this phenomenon admonishes all of us to become researchers and reporters and most of all educators. The whole world should be watching and listening, don't you think? And we need to do it, that's our job. But instead, right now, as we're meeting here and delving into so many different aspects of this field, most of our friends, our families, our co-workers remain in that blissful state of unawareness. So we all have a job to do. But that's not to say that no one out there is listening and watching, however. And one of the things I want to discuss here is the information about those folks who are paying attention to us, our own government, which we will get to a little bit later. 
I'm going to be very limiting on the topics I discuss here because I could talk the rest of the day on the two books and the information that uh, I've been fortunate enough to learn from the people with whom I've been doing this research. And I'm not going to do that to you. It's Saturday. If you were partying last night like I am, the sooner we get to the cartoon and get out of here, I think the more rested we'll be for the things coming up the rest of the day. And there's ex some extremely important talks going to be going on later. But I'm going to limit my talks today to just a few topics uh, that I feel are, are crucial. And these include the nature, or the, I'm sorry, the use of illusion and deception in the UFO and abduction scenarios. And also the nature of some of the physical procedures which abductees report experiencing during these encounters. Since, since 1992, when my family's personal account was published in Into the Fringe, I've been engaged in two fairly lengthy investigations. And the results of this work, we recently published um, in the books Taken, Inside the Alien Human Abduction Agenda, and Masquerade of Angels. And although Taken was published first, um, I'd actually been working with Ted Rice and Barbara Bartholick on the research that led to Masquerade quite a while before the work in Taken. So I'm going to refer to Masquerade's material first this morning. And then I'm going to look briefly at the reports of the eight women who contributed their accounts to the material in Taken. And as I do so, I just want to point out again several important correlations to some of the things in, in the material from the women in Taken that had already turned up in the work that Barbara and I were doing with Ted Rice. So both of these discussions will be brief and I will take the final half hour or so of my allotted time for a, a video presentation of some of the many drawings and photos and a video excerpt that I, uh, from women involved in the Taken project that I was unable to include in the book. That's one of the things I really uh, wish we could have done was to include a number of these illustrations. So I'm going to do that today to try to make up for what we were not able to do in the book. <clears throat> in 1991, when I first met Ted Rice, I was naturally intrigued by his memory of a mass abduction experience in Shreveport, Louisiana. <coughs> but I had no idea that looking into his report would lead me into areas that I'd never had to deal with before in this field. Um, accounts of angels and apparitions of bargains made with ghostly guardians, of spiritualist philosophy, and psychic work assisted by spirit guides. I mean, all of this was part of Ted's extraordinary experiences, but it was not anything in my field of expertise, believe me. But in listening to Ted's accounts, I began to see evidence that was more familiar to me, thank God, uh, evidence that was very consistent with UFO sightings and abduction reports that I'd already come to know about. And since Ted had recalled an abduction involving a number of people, I wanted to see, first off, if there were any confirming <coughs> evidence that we could locate. And as we proceeded, Barbara and I, with interviews of many of the people from Ted's past, as well as his more recent experiences in the, in the present, we did find that such evidence actually was available and sur surfacing in consciously recalled events attested to by a number of witnesses. In fact, uh, four of Ted's neighbors <clears throat> described unusual events, also consciously remembered, from the night of the mass abduction that Ted had remembered in 1989. Now, two of these witnesses were so disturbed by their memories of these events that the fear level was so high they wouldn't even let us include their accounts in the book. They shared them with us privately. So I would point out one thing for those of you who are not involved in direct investigation and working with abductees, that contrary to all the debunkers' claims that abductees and UFO witnesses tell their story for some personal gain, it's actually very difficult for those involved to risk coming forward with their accounts. And I would say for 99% of those who do make their experiences public, the resulting liabilities often outweigh the assets that they may gain from doing so. After thoroughly interviewing Ted about his conscious memories, um, we both felt that there were important gaps in several of these events that were worth investigating with hypnotic regression. And I'm not going to take time here today to argue the merits and the problems of regression work, 
but I will say that in my experience it's proven to be a very useful and manageable tool of research and that without it I think we would be left to deal only with alien controlled information which abductees are sent home with after their experiences. Now it's important to note uh, that at the time Ted began his work with Barbara and with me he had been involved for most of his adult life in spiritualist work. Uh, an extraordinary series of encounters that he had in Sun Valley, Idaho with a mysterious woman, beautiful and young, who called herself Maya, first introduced Ted to metaphysical matters and also made him aware of his own psychic abilities. I would remind you that Maya is the Hindu term for illusion, by the way, and that Maya also turns up in a number of other people's experiences, often in the guise of some Pleiadian star being. Ted, at the time of meeting his Maya, had no thoughts on these lines, no information about such things, and certainly took her simply to be the very mysterious, beautiful woman that he experienced. In the account in, in Masquerade of Angels, however, you will find that there was more mystery to Maya's presence there in Sun Valley than Ted had any idea of at the time he was in, engaged with her. Still, Coming face to face with his own abilities through some of these encounters and time spent with Maya, Ted was very reluctant to pursue these ideas or this, this ability he apparently had. And it was several years later before circumstances propelled him into psychic training and his involvement with the spiritualist church. And when he did make the commitment to go forward this, with this work, Ted went forward full tilt. In fact, he was a co-founder of the church's first congregation in Georgia. And he began doing psychic readings, which he is still doing today. Ted was convinced that the metaphysical understanding he had found was of God, and that his work served God's higher purposes as revealed to Ted by his spirit guides from the other side. <laughs> but intermixed with Ted's paranormal events and psychic work, were some startling encounters, encounters with apparently non-human entities, including, in 1989, of course, the abduction along with some of his neighbors. And at that point, Ted discovered that perhaps a different force had been intruding into his life for a number of years. And this was a force that his spirit guides had never bothered to mention, explain, and that his spiritualist training did not delve into either. So Ted needed some new information, and uh, this led to our contact and investigation. And as it progressed, it became clear that the research into all of these extraordinary experiences could take several years. But after the first two years, we felt that the information we had gathered was important enough to communicate it as soon as possible, albeit going on with the research, and we're continuing to do that to this, this point right now. We stopped and did the material uh, organization that resulted in Masquerade, which was published in 1994. And we have full intentions of following up this report with everything else that Barbara and Ted and I have continued to uncover and are continuing to pursue at this point, as soon as it's feasible to get this material back out to you as, as a sequel, a follow-up, an ongoing investigation. <coughs> A full account of our first two years of work is found in Masquerade of Angels, but for brevity's sake today, I'm going to focus on only three aspects of the uh, alien ag agenda as it relates to the material that Ted and Barbara and I have, have had to deal with. The first matter is the intrinsic deception at the heart of this agenda, and that's something that's become clearer with every new report that surfaces. Whether we choose to call it screen memory, telepathic mind control, technological mind control, or virtual reality scenarios, the entities involved in the abduction phenomenon employ masterful illusory capabilities. And I don't think the importance of this fact can be stressed strongly enough. It must affect all of our thinking and our research when it comes to these alien human contacts. In Ted's experiences, for example, there were several occasions 
where such masquerading techniques were employed, and I could spend, as I said, the rest of the morning just dealing with these, and I'm going to be making very brief references, and hope you maybe want to read about the rest of it in the book. One instance involved the appearance of Ted's deceased grandfather on board a craft into which he and his grandmother had been taken when Ted was a young boy. Um, I think I spoke about this a couple of years ago when I was uh, first working on Ted's material and I didn't identify that this was Ted's story I was referring to. The scenario involved persuading his grandmother uh, to engage in a sexual activity with an non-human entity and when she refused to do so saying she had only ever made love with her husband and he was dead the aliens produced the dead husband in another instance uh, Ted watched a scenario that surely was not occurring in normal reality terms uh, I call it a virtual reality scenario and this began shortly after he had heard a very quiet sound like helicopter blades <coughs> And in this ongoing event after the helicopter blade noise, uh, Ted watched as a, a human-looking entity dressed in military clothes uh, pop through the ceiling into the room, holding a young child that was very, very similar to Ted's appearance at the same age. And Ted was told that uh, they were going to return that which had been taken from him. And an account of what followed from that, again, is, is in the book. And uh, I won't take time to recite everything there to you. But the virtual reality event, there were certainly no human paratrooper popping through the ceiling carrying a young child in reality terms. But the illusion was quite as real as you and I here today. But perhaps the most illuminating of such events that uh, we in, were able to investigate involved Ted and another woman, a woman, who witnessed a third person, another woman, undergoing her own virtual reality episode, again marked at the onset by the sound of a helicopter. Now, some of you may be quick, as they say in the OJ trial, to rush to get judgment on this and conclude that these events were generated by some terrestrial, governmental, or military covert mind control operation. After all, we've got helicopter blades out there. But it should be noted that only the targeted person in these events heard the helicopters, while others in the same house or same room did not. I don't think our terrestrial helicopters are that selective in the noise they generate. I, believed, uh, I believe now that the reported and confirmed details in all of these reports are strong evidence against accepting consciously recalled alien encounter reports at face value because of the illusion capabilities, because of the screens, and because of the virtual reality technology that we have witnessed being manifest by these entities. I believe that if we v build our theories on, the, on such information, the consciously reported information only, we're building on sand, on illusions that the aliens create for us, and I think to confuse and mislead us. Now, this is not to say, however, that all alien encounters are virtual reality events, because there is also plenty of very strong evidence for the physical nature of many of these encounters. So to be perfectly objective, the definition of abduction would have to include any event or scenario that is generated externally for the targeted person, whether it be a physical encounter, a virtual reality scenario, or a telepathic con contact. Now, a second important discovery from Ted's investigation, and this was important at least for me, was the possibility of cloned human bodies produced by these abductors. And that's the second thing I'd like to, to talk about briefly today. In the mid-1970s, um, a memory of a childhood event surfaced in Ted's mind during the night while he was sleeping. And in an altered state of consciousness, he got out of bed and went to his typewriter in the middle of the night and wrote out this memory as a story. In 1991 and 92, when Ted and Barbara began a series of regressions, it occurred, it popped up in these events, this scenario that Ted had recalled as a story, but a very different version of that basic story 
emerged. Uh, a version in which he went through what can only be called a horrific experience, in which his original body he perceived as being killed and taken away, and his essence, for lack of a better word, we could call it soul energy or whatever term one would like to use, was contained temporarily in a black box, placed on a counter, and uh, transferred shortly thereafter into a cloned copy of young Ted's body. This was his perception of what occurred with him, and this is the first time I had ever heard of such things really in any detail. <coughs> Now, when we made our in external investigation, interviewing people who were part of Ted's family and friends at the times many of these things occurred, several pieces of corroborating items did come out, mm -hmm. all of which I tried to prevent, present fully in the book. But just briefly, one of the most telling, for me at least, was interviewing uh, Ted's mother. And at the time that Ted recalled being transferred into a different body, his mother recalled the suffering he went through for weeks afterwards, feeling that his body was on fire, having to soak him repeatedly in ice water, trying to bring him some comfort, and noting that the childhood diseases that Ted had had before the cloning recurred afterwards. <coughs> Excuse me. The third point that I want to correlate uh, with information from subsequent investigations in the accounts in Taken concerns the possible involvement of human, apparently military, personnel with certain abductees. Now, if nothing else, this involvement of some authoritative agency within our government should tell us that our decision-making powers that be, the structure that pretty much controls how we deal with this phenomenon as well as with everything else going on in our society, takes this phenomenon very seriously. I would guess that most of you here have already learned about the many hard pieces of evidence that do reveal the government's knowledge uh, of and involvement with the UFO question. Um, such classic presentations as um, those in clear intent and above top secret can point you in the direction of getting your hands on the paperwork generated by the government that, that makes it very clear they have involvement they have never been willing to discuss with the public. Now, the evidence for our military involvement with abductees, I will admit, is much less well documented, certainly. But for the inv individuals who are on the receiving end of this activity, it is very compelling and very traumatic. There are two basically different bodies of data relating to the possibility of human involvement. Now, the first body of data includes such external things as phone taps, mail interference, unidentified human agents who photograph the homes of abductees, photograph abductees themselves and follow them, sometimes even breaking into their homes, making threatening phone calls, uh, apparently able to make certain medical records disappear. Uh, also alleged alien artifacts disappear. And it goes all the way to the extent of direct confrontations between the military personnel and certain abductees. Sometimes to the extent of abducting the person and using a number of interrogation techniques to elicit information about the person ac person's activities with the aliens. Now, Ted Rice um, has not been the overt target of such involvement, but the accounts uh, of the eight women in Taken, which we'll get to in just a few moments, show that four of the eight women have had a variety of these experiences in their own uh, series of events. But the second body of data concerns, concerning human uh, involvement deals with facilities, typically underground, in which aliens are often seen to be working with human, military, and scientific personnel. For me, and I think for all of us, probably the big question is whether these facilities and this level of cooperation actually exist, or if abductees report these events because they've been pre presented with some type of unreal scenario, much as we're presented with the showing of a movie when we go to a theater. 
until we have located such a facility, externally verified its existence, and exposed the activities going on there that abductees report, this question's got to remain open. All we can say for sure is this. A number of unrelated accounts include descriptions of such facilities, usually with reference to either scientific or military activity, although there is a third set of reports that describes something much more disturbing, and this is uh, one of the things that turned up in the case with Ted and with certain others who are part of a great deal of investigative activity on Barbara's part and my part, that are, well, I'll just try to give you a little brief scenario of what Ted consciously recalled about this third type of human underground facility. In the mid-1980s, Ted uh, awoke one morning with conscious memories of an altered state event that occurred during the night. He was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the time, and part of the journey that he recalled from the night before included flying over a fairly desert area to a remote compound where many people were herded together. He didn't remember being involved in any actual activity, but only in seeing several areas that were accessed through this above ground compound into a large underground installation. He remembered consciously that the humans in the compound seemed extremely despondent, quite miserable, and he recalls shouting out in anger to a couple of these people sitting there, or the people who were doing the things to the humans, you can't do that, you can't treat our people like cattle, and being outraged, entirely outraged by whatever it was he had seen, but consciously only recalling the outrage, only recalling his protest, and not recalling what it was he had seen that, that generated this protest. Now, this account is also included in Masquerade, and it is one of the memories that Ted and Barbara have been able to explore with regressive hypnosis after the time that Masquerade was written. So we have uh, more information to report on this, and I'll try to make sure that the report on all of our work that sheds new light on what we've already presented in Masquerade will get out to you as soon as possible. What Ted recalled at the time of the regressive hypnosis is without doubt outrageous and horrifying to any human sensibility. And I would remind you that such scenarios have not yet been shown to be a factual reality. I would also remind you that Ted is by no means the only person to have remembered such details of areas like these in this underground facility in which abductees report seeing human bodies physically processed and that very similar accounts have come from other people's conscious recollections as well as from hypnotically retrieved descriptions. If such facilities don't exist, I think that we still have a big problem in understanding the nature of this phenomenon because we should be concerned to understand why such a grisly, horrifying illusion would be presented to so many abductees and what purpose that could conceivably serve for an alien agenda. After drafting this initial report on the investigation with Ted and Barbara, I then became involved in the project that resulted in Taken. And this was a special study for me. Uh, I wanted to do a specific set of reports that had homogenous background so we could make some comparisons and correlations with the material. So in order to have a more homogenous group for the study, I chose eight women from various parts of the country who had contacted me after reading Into the Fringe and with whom I had begun initial uh, sharing of information. I let the women relate many of their experiences in their own words rather than trying to take over and give you a second-hand account of, of something that in first-hand would be much more meaningful to you. And I hope as the subtitle Inside the Alien Human Abduction Agenda implies, that the reader would be able to immerse into these intimate experiences which are so very difficult to relate without the words of the people who have gone through them. After working through the eight different case reports and doing as much investigating as we could manage considering the widespread geograph geography of the women's locations, I then correlated the reports and the accounts and referenced over a hundred different details about the entities, 
the procedures, the communications, and all the secondary events that make this abduction phenomena so complex and confusing. And I've included um, several pages of this correlation as part of Taken. There's also a lengthy comparison chart and an explanation or an analysis of the corroborated um, details. For quick reference, you can look through the small chart and then there's a, a larger discussion afterwards. But the correlations that we focused on covered 10 categories. Types of contacts, types of entities, types of physical exams and procedures, types of other activities, types of communications, settings for these encounters, reports on the bodily effects from the encounters, reports on external effects in the environment of the abductees, and after effects on the abductee, as well as correlating certain um, items of personal history, such as ethnic background, etc. Now, for the purpose of this brief presentation this morning, I'll only focus on a handful of examples from the reports of these eight women, but I would like to identify them in their location. Pat in Florida, Polly in New York, Lisa in Alabama, Beth in Puerto Rico, Angie in Tennessee, and Jane, Anita, and Amy from three different areas of Texas. Now, to begin with the evidence of human involvement, Four of the eight women, namely Pat, Lisa, Beth, and Angie, have reported face-to-face -face contact with military personnel in a, in a variety of, of situations. I think you will find the most surprising to be that of Pat's family's experience. And it is confirmed by all of her living relatives, and there are only a couple left after uh, the length of time between the event happening and us beginning this investigation. The members of Pat's family uh, in 1954 included Pat at the age 12, a brother and a sister, her mother and stepfather, and a grandmother all living in a rural location. And they were part of the entire family having an alien abduction and subsequent contact by the military. One day after the event in 1954 in which alien entities took the family members on board a landed craft in the backyard of their farm in Indiana and carried out certain physical procedures. One day after this happened, Pat and her siblings that are still alive report that a contingency of men in military uniforms and military vehicles arrived at their farm, sequestered the entire family for several days. One day after this occurred, how did they know it happened? Pat remembers being drugged and being interrogated about the alien encounters. She remembers being told repeatedly that it did not happen and that what she remembered was not real. But this was not Pat's only encounter with the military. As she experienced another conscious abduction just two years ago, and this time she recalled the presence of a non-human entity in addition to the military personnel who took her from her home in Florida in a military truck to a rural location where an underground facility existed and where she was taken inside and examined. Both Lisa and Angie also reported interrogations by human agents <coughs> and abductions by human personnel in which they were questioned and physically examined or underwent certain other physical procedures which I recounted it or let them recount uh, in their own words in the book. Beth, who's in Puerto Rico, also recalled an, ab an abduction by human agents and a fifth woman, Amy, remembered an altered state scenario in which there were both alien and human-looking people present in an underground installation. Although, as she says in Taken, there were reasons to doubt the strictly human nature of some of the men she did encounter there. They looked perfectly human, she said, except for their eyes, which had the vertical slits. Most of the eight women and taken also report the typical type of human interference signals such as phone disruption, helicopter overflights and other aviation activities over their homes that would indicate a terrestrial source. And I've even witnessed on one such occasion uh, while talking on the phone with Angie an interruption and a comment by the human who was monitoring our phone conversation. 
As we were, Angie and I were discussing on the phone a statement made by one of the humanoid looking aliens uh, in one of her recent experiences. She asked me if I thought the alien statement that their origin was somewhere in the area of Cassiopeia was a possibility. What did I think about that? And as we discussed this, a completely human male voice intruded into our phone conversation after a little electronic zipping noise and said, quote, there's a lot of them out there and we know where they come from. <laughs> and then he zipped off the line and that was, you know. So, you know, it's not all secondhand information that I'm reporting. We do have occasions to witness this ourselves. There's also a number of reports from the women that indicate a variety of illusory scenarios, one of the points I wanted to stress today, sometimes involving sexual situations, sometimes involving prophetic dreams or visions, and sometimes clearly screened memories of real encounters that left them with false recollections rather than with the real details of these events. I'd like to use my remaining time to discuss uh, the nature of the physical procedures, however, reported by many of these women, and these women are very typical and representative cases for so much of the, the material reported that never gets to you or to me because it's kept very private and very confidential. Because I think we need to be aware of just how physically oriented so much of the abduction agenda really is. In addition to the bodily effects you're already probably familiar with, including rashes, hair loss, eye problems, nausea, and for women especially gynecological problems and irregularities, the greatest area of concern in my thinking is that of the implants, uh, the devices that several of the women, like so many other abductees around the planet, describe as being inserted into their bodies. I think the most intriguing information um, that I report and taken, and that in fact I've come across in all of this work, has come from Amy's account of this altered state scenario I referred to briefly where she was taken to an underground installation. She felt this was what she perceived. And uh, I would remind you as I go through this brief presentation that in every encounter, the human's state of consciousness is externally altered and controlled in every encounter. And knowing the virtual reality capabilities and the screen abilities, we need to remember not to take everything as being the gospel truth that people come away remembering. Now this has, however, been explored with some very thorough regress regression work, and so I do feel a little more confident in what I'm going to tell you about Amy's memory of this event today than I would if it were strictly her conscious recollection. In part of this scenario, Amy recalled going into the underground room uh, full of equipment typically, typically described from other alien encounters and other underground facilities, by the way, and seeing a, a quite a large number of alien entities working here in this environment. But as I said earlier, there were also several human-looking men present, <coughs> at least human-looking except for their eyes. One particular alien in the group that Amy perceived to be a female interacted with her uh, directly. And this female alien began, basically, with an apology to Amy for the intrusions that some of her race were making into human lives. This entity proceeded to explain that she and her group were working with some humans to try to counteract what the rest of her group was doing to us. All right, so we gotta get the set up here on what Amy is being told. As the entity explained the negative nature of these intrusions to which, for which she was apologizing, she then told Amy she wanted to remove two implants. This is one of the things they were doing to help counteract this negative intrusion activity, was to, Im to remove implants that the other group was putting into humans. And Amy recalled having a, an implant removed from one of her ears and another smaller metallic implant removed from the base of her neck, her skull. Amy was told by the alien several things about how these implants functioned and she reports that she was not happy to hear that they could be used to control the implanted abductees in any number of ways. Now the area into which the newer implants are inserted, Amy was told, corresponds to the part of the brain known as the reticular formation, and it doesn't have anything to do with Zetas, by the way. 
Uh, thanks to uh, Marianne Friedman, who's here this weekend from Arizona, and who was uh, wonderful enough to share a lot of her research into the medical aspects of this brainstem activity. I want to just briefly refer to this, and then on Sunday morning, Marianne is going to go into a little more detail at one of the mini sessions. So I encourage you to listen to this material. The functions of the reticular formation that Marianne got me started looking at uh, are staggering. And I'm sure some of you have been through this already. For me, it was just information I had to re-correlate with the uh, accounts of the implant reports, especially those uh, that Amy had, had relayed to me from her friendly implant-removing alien. The function of, I'll just read you a very brief statement from Nigel Calder's book, The Mind of Man, one of the earlier uh, classics of our modern time, on brain activity and brain research. And here is a quote about this reticular formation area. If the primary job of the brain is to enable its owner to respond effectively to events, the strongest claimant for mastery is not the roof or the cerebral cortex at all, but the brain stem. The brain stem net is well placed to monitor all the nerves connecting brain and body. It knows what is going on better than any other single part of the brain. The brain stem net exerts its authority by sending out impulses which stimulate or inhibit nerve action throughout the brain and the body. It can override activity in the spinal cord. It regulates the signals from the eyes, the ears, and other sense organs, thereby providing an agency for selecting what is to be attended to from moment to moment. And it is this part of the brain that Amy was told was now the most common area for the newer alien implants to be located. If the aliens are indeed placing control implants into this area, then they would be able, as you've seen from this just very brief description of the brainstem activity, they would be able to control everything from the person's level of consciousness to the bodily functions, to the memory and thought processes, and the assessment of all sensory input. Now, if you don't think the implications of that kind of control are overwhelming, think again. And I hope Marianne will stimulate some ex exciting conversations with you tomorrow morning about the possibilities of this area of the brain being the point of alien control through which abductees can be kept awake, put to sleep, put in an altered state, made to get up and do things that they would not choose to do, made to say things they would not say, made to forget things that they have said and done, etc. All sensory input being controlled by this area through the implant, any number of realities can be presented to the abductee that are not really there. And what one remembers is control through this area, so the repression of memory of these events is very easily controlled as well. I think the implications are staggering. So also, however, are the implications of the final point I want to make this morning, and that is the reports on the cloning of human bodies that I previously encountered with Ted's investigation. In the women of Taken, two of the women, Pat and Lisa, both remember being shown cloned copies of their bodies, just as Ted reported having a cloned copy of his body. But the explanations that Pat and Lisa received from the aliens about these clone bodies are highly contradictory. As I talk about in the book, Pat, whose alien experiences, now this is the woman who had the 1954 uh, family abduction in Indiana, followed by the military's arrival and sequestering and drugging and so on. Pat had had, throughout her alien encounters, a very religious atmosphere or overtone to these events instrumented by the aliens. Uh, for instance, the first time uh, there on the farm that the family was abducted, when, when Pat's grandmother began to, what we would say now, freak out and start praying to Jesus for help as these little grays came into the room, a, a blue beam of light came through the ceiling, just like in Star Trek, and uh, Jesus popped out of it and said, in effect, uh, they're with me, it's okay. <laughs> and as I'm very fond of saying, and I don't know why I like this so much, except it always gets me, I asked Pat what Jesus looked like, 
And she said, oh, he was beautiful. He was so in awe-inspiring. He was blonde-haired and blue-eyed, <laughs> just beautiful. And I said, hey, Pat, you know, uh, look back at the New Testament. I don't think that's what Jesus probably looked like, historically speaking. And it went right over Pat's head, and she said, with, you know, tears of joy in her eyes, well, this one did. <laughs> They knew how to push Pat's buttons. She was a very religious person. She was also told essentially that the angels, I mean the aliens there with her were angels and that their job was to prepare new bodies as mentioned in the Bible for the coming return of Jesus and the resurrection. When Jesus comes down with the legion of spacecraft to uh, carry out this uh, changeover, why well, it's the aliens who are in charge of providing those new bodies. You want to see yours, Pat, they said. <laughs> so this was wonderful. Pat is now assured that uh, when the resurrection comes, she's got the vehicle for it. Lisa, on the other hand, down in Alabama, was told that the cloned copy of her body could be used in a very threatening manner. In effect, that it could be used to replace her if she didn't cooperate with the alien program and that no one would know the difference. Not quite the same story as the resurrection. I would point out that such an implication of threat and replacement was also made to Ted Rice during an abduction when he was a young teenager and there were several other teenagers abducted with him at that time and cloned replacement threats were made also at that point. So these are the three points that I really wanted to make briefly this morning before I, I do the presentation of the video uh, with illustrations from the women in Taken. And like a good English teacher, I'm supposed to summarize what I've said, and I'm going to do that right now. For you to consider three points, hopefully. First, our own human authorities are seriously concerned about and involved with some aspects of the alien abduction agenda. If they take it seriously, it would behoove us to do likewise. And also, when human agencies are involved, there has to be some sort of trail of events. And I think thus a very strong possibility exists for some intrepid researchers to get out there and uncover and follow this trail. There has to be a record of human involvement. Second, much of this agenda clearly has a physical focus that should raise some very strong questions about some of the alien claims to be here on a primarily spiritual mission. The implication of both the implants and the reports of the clone bodies are so potentially explosive that a great deal of effort toward investigating these allegations is certainly called for if we're really serious about wanting to understand the motivations of these entities and the purposes of their contacts with us. And third, I think we need to recognize that deceptions are employed at almost every level of this interaction to keep abductees from knowing about the actual events and the actual entities involved in these encounters. To me, maybe I'm just a suspicious sort, this implies that there's something they don't want us to know about. And often what seems implied from the reports is that there is something within us, the humans, something of which we could be capable, something of resistance or altering of this scenario that the abductors absolutely do not want us to be aware of. They go to great lengths to program our thinking about our encounters with them, that we are subordinate, that we are helpless, or that we are dependent, or that we belong to them. The, it, the list goes on and on. And they go to a great deal of trouble to convince us in every way that they can that we can do nothing about controlling these situations. The good news is that in a number of cases in the past couple of years, that hasn't proven to be true. Abductees are finding more and more specific instances in which they are able to resist the illusion <coughs> suggestions, in which they are able to say no to procedures, and in fact when they have been able to break free of actual controls. This to me is a great step forward and I think it's going to be something growing with any, with any luck. We're going to find abductees are realizing there are ways to, to change this entire pattern of activity. The fact that in several people's encounters during the past few years they've managed to see or perceive more than the abductees wanted is probably the most positive sign I have to report to you today. Also as a species, our ability to perceive the energies and the presence of these entities I think may be increasing. Maybe it's thanks to a number of possible influences. I'm, I'm not really trying to make a claim for where this increased perceptive ability may be coming from, but I think it's probably part of 
the accounting for the massive awakening to this phenomenon that you and I and our generation has witnessed, especially in the last decade. If these encounters have been a hidden part of humanity's reality for a long time, you know, as such some researchers believe and, and present evidence for, then don't you think that the recent, fairly recent explosion of con contact reports is some kind of proof that things are not business as usual in this abduction game right now? Something is changing? But without an understanding of the screens and the virtual reality capabilities, however, we are left with only alien-created illusions to assess and act upon. And I think that keeps us from any real useful responses to the situations occurring in our lives and so many other people's lives today. Only a fool would ignore the transitional state of events and ideas and beliefs in the time in which we're living right now. And I don't think any of us here are fools. All of these things that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk this morning are polarizing our society at an alarming rate, and we have no idea right now really of the direction things are going to go in the future. And with, that's in the general society, within ufology, theories abound and arguments rage over especially the abduction controversy. And you know, sometimes it's reached such extremes that I feel very confident this morning in predicting that we won't have the answer anytime soon if this keeps up. We should be admonished to get past the differences and start working on the similarities and the shared interests that we all have in this field. But we do have some answers at least, some start toward answers anyway. For instance, we know abductions are real. We know that the abducting agent uh, agenda includes very physical, physically oriented goals. We know that the abductors contradict themselves and often give false information, as well as information we don't have any way of testing. We know they are capable of masterful illusions. We know that they always take control of us during encounters, which to me is a sign that they fear an unfettered homo sapien. And we know that our government knows about this situation and is actively involved to the level of carrying out covert and illegal actions against its own citizenry. No matter what the truth ultimately proves to be, we have to go for it. I mean, without it, we're like children playing with shadows. And we're ignorant and we're certainly unempowered to deal with and confront whatever the real entities are behind this masquerade. To take it all at face value is foolish. To take none of it as fa at face value is ridiculous. Investigations into this field cannot be, there cannot be anything more important for us to be doing right now than to dig past our wishes, dig past our fears, and dig for objective reality and understanding. Well, that's the sermon for this morning, folks. Um, <laughs> What I'd like to do with the rest of my time is to show you and make brief commentary on some of the illustrations and photographs from the women in Taken, and I'll uh, ask the gang over there in the corner to start the video. And before you do, Craig, just a moment. Most of the video is of slides, I mean, of, of photos and drawings. At the very end of this, however, is an excerpt from a videotape one of the women in Taken made when she was having extreme military uh, aircraft activity over her uh, rural cattle ranch in Tennessee. And I might point out that mysterious deaths and cattle mutilations on that during the, that area during this time corresponded to those in Alabama that Linda has made us all familiar with. And none of which were explained, even when there were no mutilations, the dead cattle were simply all they could find was unknown toxicology and it led in a year's time to a loss of eleven thousand dollars worth of cattle so this is something pretty big for the family involved here so there will be a little bit of video at the end of this so Craig let's go for it this is the farmhouse in Indiana in 1954 Pat and her siblings and her mom this is where the aliens abducted the family and then the next morning the military came and sequestered them um, this is the only drawing that Pat has made of later uh, experiences. She called that little device the soul machine, and she sat on it and ran her hands over those little holes of different colored light, and she heard a sound they told her was the sound of her soul. I'd love to hear about other reports similar to this, if any of you know of them. 
This was also in the facility where she was shown the clone body. This is Polly's drawing of some of the bulbous, wrinkled-headed aliens. She said they almost posed for her to get this conscious memory. You know how often they don't give you very much to take back consciously. And this kind of uh, alien description has turned up in other, other uh, people's reports. We'll see one more in here, in fact, in a little bit. From Lisa, here's one of her. She says, I'm no artist. Don't, don't tell me I'm, I am, because I know I'm not. And I think she did great for it being no artist to show the hooded figures. Uh, these are less frequently reported, but uh, this one she was able actually to see some facial features where very often the hood completely obscures them. This is Lisa's drawing of another of the bulbous-headed entities, sort of similar to what we saw with Polly's drawing earlier. And these have been reported in a number of other cases as well. <coughs> Not your typical gray or reptoid or insectoid, but something seeming to have more of a porpoise type bulbous for it. A typical gray in a hat, right? Uh, and this happens. I remember seeing one myself uh, when I was quite young. Um, she said this was surprising because its mouth would open. And we have a few cases where the little slit has actually opened. So just one of Lisa's representations. This one, she says, is very similar to a figure in Linda Howe's latest book with the flat, ridged nose area. This entity, she's not real fond of at all, was involved in what she said was one of the rape scenarios she was put through. Let's see what's coming up next. Ah, Lisa's drawing of the reptilian entity that was very aggressive sexually with her as well. And again, she says, please remember, she's no artist, but it was a brown, scaly, hard exterior with the slit eyes, vertically slit eyes, and clawed appendages or fingers. And a very robust entity. Symbols that she has seen in these, and this is so typical. I mean, we could flash symbols, and so many of them are some version of the triangle and the circle. We'll see another uh, variety of this kind of symbol a little bit later with An uh, Angie's drawings. From Anita in Texas, this is a drawing of what she called the tan ones, and she makes a very distinct, big distinction between the tans and the grays. She said the grays uh, could care less about us. They're very official or impersonal, but the tans seem to go to a great deal of trouble to make her want to love them and, and to, to elicit love from her. She remembered at one point patting it on the face and saying, too bad it's not real. <laughs> this is the drawing from Anita's granddaughter who lives with her of what she said were the mushroom men who had come into her room one night. These, however, she said were no more than maybe a foot and a half, two feet tall. And you note the drawing details that she is uh, included in four fingers and so on. Here's Beth's drawing in Puerto Rico of one of the doctors on board who dealt with her and her entire family in 1978 when they had a, a, a massive abduction. Jorge Martin has investigated a lot of this case, uh, but it's only been reported in Spanish so far, so, except for what we haven't taken. Widow Peak, Caroline, very typical report of humanoids. When Beth recalled being taken by the military to a desert area where there was an above ground compound area, much, much like what Ted described, being then taken again underground through this uh, adobe or, or old type structure into a room with military where she said two men in, in astronaut suits made a presentation here in this underground room to her and a number of other military people who had her there. And she was there not by invitation but by duress. So very similar to uh, what Ted had remembered from the mid 80s event in Albuquerque. We don't know where these facilities might be, but you know, Kirtland's not that far away. <coughs> one of Jane, also one of the women in Taken from Texas, one of the photographs of a UFO, uh, Jane's entire scenario began with a number of overflights of UFOs witnessed by neighbors and relatives, and she was instructed on this day to clean her camera, get new film, and go out. They were going to be there. And uh, this is one of the shots. Uh, some of the body marks that we've talked about so many times, the triangle of punctures uh, on Jane's arm. Uh, are typical of what most of us have, re have had recurrently. <coughs> Let's see if we can go on to some other physical marks, I believe, here. We'll, we'll see a little bit later, if not right now. I can't remember the order of these things. Yeah, this scoop mark on uh, Jane's leg. Now, this is, there are some scoop mark reports that we've had, including one in the family, where after the scoop begins to heal, a waxy grayish substance oozes out of this for a while and, and then it heals up to the regular scoop mark that we know and this is one instance of that happening with Jane. 
Jane's drawing of a memory of being before this council of long-haired, light entities. She cannot recall what they were telling her, however, but this was the best she could do to capture the feel of these faceless entities. And again, this is often a similar situation reported by other people, including one other in the book taken, um, Amy. Uh, an unusual scenario, uh, Jane recalled only snatches of, a, of an encounter in which she saw robed aliens at work in one of the facilities and she heard them listing certain places in the Texas, Louisiana area by name, certain towns and locations and then the words activate, activate, activate. The little black box, the memory of the faces seeing her feet as she's being carried out of here, all just very partial glimpses from an event with uh, in Jane's recollections. And the little black box is very similar to the box used in Ted's uh, cloning soul transfer event. And you notice these weird black uh, tubes coming out. We're going to see that later in other drawings. Jane's most intense uh, recent encounter, she tried to relay in a series of paintings. Being on the desert planet, so many people report, seeing the UFO coming in, being under control where she couldn't move, and then watching a series of changes where the UFO seemed to beam down this, uh, this illuminated globe type um, structure with she markings she couldn't really capture in all their detail. And then this going to another stage of transformation from this globe-like decorated object to a floating dark globe with antenna that began to come very close to her, so close that she became fearful she was going to be knocked off the mesa where she was sitting. And the last conscious memory she had of this event was of this globe coming up right to her face. Under regression, we found out some more information about what went on, including an implanting uh, procedure that the, this globe was involved with in Jane's uh, suppressed memories. This is Angie, the woman in Tennessee. Uh, one of the rectangular uh, scorched areas or dead areas on her property uh, from an event, this now for a year and a half, of course, nothing grew there. This was an event she had recalled seeing the night before, or briefly before, I can't recall if it was just exactly the night before, in which there was this rectangular device with two aliens out in the yard near the, the barn area apparently taking soil samples, which of course, you know, they've been doing since time immemorial. They just can't get enough of our soil. <laughs> but the mark on the ground was physically there for quite a while. And uh, if anybody's willing to pay for some soil sample testings, we've got some. Here's the area of the rural cattle ranch where the mutilations and unexplained deaths have occurred. And you're going to see video from this area of overflights. I just wanted you to see how remote this was from any, you know, highly populated area. One of the unexplained deaths, this was not a mutilation, it was the bio, I mean the report from the vet was unknown toxicology and there were a number of other cases both in the Tennessee and Alabama area during this time. But there were also mutilations uh, among the cattle on Angie's property. There's one that seems to be almost an interrupted mutilation. I'd love to get Linda's analysis of this. You see a triangular patch of skin has been cut but not taken off yet. The jawbone has been cleaned. It's like something either was human activity mimicking alien mutilations or an interrupted mutilation of some sort on a calf there. Angie's fetus, after an alien implant that she uh, later miscarried, she actually retrieved the fetus, but under control, of course, took care of making sure it did not, well, it was re retrieved by aliens, she believes, uh, the day later but she saw the size of it and the features of it. She said when they came back to induce the miscarriage that this was the instrument, the long instrument that was used to induce uh, the miscarriage vaginally and then this little container was, she said she had no idea what the little container was for, but she did remember that also being present on the bed in her bedroom when they came to cause this loss of the child. Some of the marks from some of Amy's, uh, Angie's experiences, again, the sets of punctures um, after, correlated with consciously remembered events. One of the fetal nursery representations, this is uh, what Angie saw, and this one is included in the book, so you can read more carefully what description she has for the various things. 
very similar to what else we've heard about. Angie is, a, is an illustrator artist, so she has done a lot better with some of her recollection drawings than many others. But again, in the corner, you see the little black box with those hoses running out of it, just like Jane had seen in Texas. Um, in fact, Angie has a number of excellent illustrations, but we could do that all day. Here's one of them, the one of the suited grays, which she said rarely would she see them in clothes. This one had an outfit on. And she didn't know what the little jumble of shapes on the table was. She said, maybe it was art. I don't know. Nothing was explained to me. She also had encounters with, a no well, actually seven different alien physical types. This one with the bumpy uh, skin, the bumpy... Uh, joints of the fingers, etc. And some of the aliens with which she had contact were completely human looking, although they didn't act human, they did look human, notably brown haired and blonde haired humans. Here's one of the uh, the brown haired woman and man, and he's got some equipment, we can't really see it very clearly here, as if he's scanning, I don't know, the air or something, taking readings of some sort, and the woman escorted Angie into a uh, back to the craft for her encounter later on. This was just out on her property. This one, both Angie and her husband recalled the little troll-like or dwarf-like entities coming into the room, and in fact, it was her husband who was taken away in this encounter. And they both remembered all of this consciously. And these troll or dwarf-like entities turn up, uh, as you'll see in the correlated uh, chart of comparisons there in the book, with more than just Angie in the book, and with a lot of other people, too. Again, we see uh, one of the emblems. We've got the triangles. I think they show up almost every time unless we have the serpent showing up. She said this was on a belt that one of the entities was wearing. Our timing is a little strange here. Okay, one of the craft that Angie recalls seeing out over the property, and I have not seen a report exactly like this one before, but um, wanted to include some of the anomalous uh, drawings rather than just the typical things that we often get reports about. Another one over the area, and that's the bottom view of it. It seemed like a fiery or molten area, very similar to what's reported in the bottom of the Gulf Breeze crown type craft. And that craft here, you can see for comparison of size, Angie below and the craft above when she was being beamed into it. Again, out in this area that's very near the northern Alabama border where so much activity has gone on in the past, what, three or four years. This is a ground plan of one of the rural military facilities to which Angie was taken. Uh, a series of buildings, of areas where craft were parked, of a perimeter fence, this was, and of, of a rural dirt road. She was taken into one of these buildings and interrogated. And there were a number of other humans there. She said apparently also abductees besides military personnel. Close up of this, the view of the building into which she was being taken and one of the people who was escorting her. And uh, she was taken along with three other women on one occasion into uh, this facility. We know of another facility into which she's been taken uh, under conscious control. Uh, it's not the same as this one. This strange little craft, uh, from one point of view, looks like a winged aircraft uh, from the military. You've got a little flag on it. The other side, not there. And that back compartment is where she and the three other women were, were put, placed when they were picked up and taken to a facility. In one of the underground places that Angie recalls seeing was what she called the upturned helicopter or the rotorless helicopter. And again, we have gotten reports from around the country over the, you know, through the past of similar copter type devices that apparently are not copters. Two pictures, Angie was taking pictures of overflight trails and here it just does not show up. So, but if we could look at these up close, these are taken identical, you know, moments apart, snap, snap. And in one is uh, a very small object that under uh, enlargement appears to be a spacecraft. It's not there in the other one. So we need more analysis on that. Now onto Amy in Texas. This is a drawing of her conscious recollection of her first UFO sighting in Denton, Texas um, in the early 1980s. And there was a missing time episode and a very confusing screen memory overlaying what she consciously recalled from this. 
Amy recalls being taught many things by the entities that have, encountered, have worked with her, including, as here with her two young daughters, being shown how to pass through solid objects. And since she had mastered it, now they were going on to the daughters. Of course, she can't do it when she's not with the aliens. One of her daughter's drawings of uh, a ball of light that she has seen a couple of times in the house, and this is a young child's drawing. She says she's only seen this one a couple of times. It's two to three feet wide. But the one she has seen more frequently is much smaller, like a probe device that we've heard reported numerous times. Uh, this one being slightly different, as you'll see here, she said it's like a wiggly tail appendage coming off of this one. But she says this is frequently in the room with her. And uh, she doesn't seem to be fearful of anything to do with these probes, uh, these light sources, although she's not real happy when the aliens have you know, interacted with her. This is a recent just doodle that the daughter had made at eight and a half years old that the mother managed to get me a copy of. And you can see a lot of the what's, what she's doodling out here. Um, obviously has some significance to the abduction experiences she's had. Amy's memory of consciously waking up as she's floating down her hallway into the kitchen and out the back door uh, in one of her events, she said that was the conscious part. After she got outside, she didn't remember anything, but you can imagine waking up floating and being a little bit surprised. <laughs> she quite was. This is the FEMA underground center of government facility across the street from which Amy lived at the time she was abducted and taken to an underground facility with human and alien entities. This is also the same facility that was less than two miles from the house my husband and I lived in when he was abducted by military and taken to an underground facility. Just thought you might want to drop in and tour the place. Her screen memory um, began with this abduction where the alien apologized and removed the implants was seeing what she thought was a big moon with the entities floating above them. Now, a lot of this is from conscious recollection and some of the drawings are also from what she get a glean through hypnosis. <coughs> she recalled being in her dining room where these alien, the, the non-earth representatives as she called them and the human representatives first came to get her to take her to this facility and the men all look quite human. She said, in fact, she almost thought she recognized one of them as a political figure, but she wasn't really certain. She was told they were ex-professional pilots, military people, and so on, but when she got up close to one, she could see the vertical slit eyes and began looking at the other men and said she was aware that they had contact lens coverings over their pupils. And without the coverings, I mean, with the coverings, they just looked, she said, you couldn't tell them from your neighbors. Uh, she, was, they were, she was told to not remember this scene, and she fought very hard to do so. The, the facility room into which she was taken, now uh, the little drawing at the front of that is Amy with the female um, alien who was apologizing and removing the implants. She said the entity had a plastic-like mask over its face. And it's very confusing what the purpose of that might have been because if it was to keep the eyes from having any kind of control, certainly it didn't work because the eyes were the only thing that actually did show on her face. And we'll see that a little closer up in just a moment. Um, I think. Yeah. Um, Amy's drawing of the first the move, removal of the implant from the ear, which seemed to be of a malleable, flesh-colored, um, substance and when it was pulled out of the ear and shown to her it disintegrated and we have another report Barbara uh, Barthlick has another case report where an identical ear implant did exactly this when removed it just broke into pieces and dissolved disappeared but she said when she looked at it before it uh, changed she could see what were embedded in it like finely placed little wires or filaments before that were in this biological looking or flexible looking material that was very flesh colored. Then the removal of the implant from the base of her neck, um, and there is still a little white circle from where that occurred. Uh, at this point, there was nothing on the, that we, we had evidence of from the ear removal. This implant was uh, more typical of some others we've seen on drawings and x-rays, um, metallic filament rod, uh, rod with little filaments on the end. She shows here, as we talked about earlier, where the implants are, the old implants were being placed, and the new ones, she's told, are going into the spine, the brain stem area. And they, the alien told her about some of the newer implants. Now, this is a, the drawings of, first, the instrument used to remove them, the little 
uh, biologically flexible looking ear implant, the spot on the back of her neck, and the implant that was taken out of that spot, the rod with little filaments on the end, and this is also in the book, one of the illustrations we were able to include. She said that she was told newer implants are being placed through an area behind and slightly below the ear and into um, the base stem of the, uh, of the brain area and the medulla oblongata. She said they looked like little tiny metallic tic tacs and that the alien told her these were the new ones. She remembered uh, getting the close up eyes to eyes things and having information imparted to her about the nature of the implants. Uh, consciously, she did not remember much about it, but she did remember she was very unhappy about what she was told. And under regression, she ret retrieved more specifics of these controls, which do match up with the reticular formation area. A more recent daytime sighting right over the Dallas-Fort Worth airport at noon when she was out on lunch break, she said was so amazing because she saw what first looked like four UFOs flying in a formation. As they got closer, they looked like airplanes, again, in formation. And then, as they kept flying, the airplanes lined up and became a solid circular object. <laughs> One of the nonsense marks, and we certainly get a lot of these, this one happens to be on Amy, marks on the body that are not punctures, not claw marks, not burns, not cuts, they're just designs. And uh, these turn up from time to time, and this one we just were able to get a good photo of. And finally, Amy's drawing of some of the helicopter harassment that has, has plagued her and her family ever since she made contact with me and began uh, working on exploring her case. And of course, many of us, including our family, have had this over and over and over. Um, Amy's had a lot with the helicopters. Angie's had a lot with numerous military flights. So give a listen. The second time it circled. February 22nd, 1.35 p.m. Second, 2 p.m. 15 minutes later, it's back. <laughs> 2 15 p.m. February 22nd. 15 minutes later, it's back. Notice this tight What could have uprooted a tree that big is beyond me. It's February 23rd. This is the day after the repeated overflights. There had been rain, but no storm that night. If you notice, trees very close to this one are totally unscathed, except for two that have sheared off top branches and no other damage to smaller limbs around them. Perhaps it's just coincidental, but it was the day following all of this activity, so she wanted to include it in case there was a relevance. You can see there was living wood. It was not a dead tree, albeit the, this would make you think so. We have samples from the tree, and it was still alive at the time this occurred. See, the tree that close to where it was uprooted is totally untouched. 
but there was a cut off branch on this top of this tree and you see no damage to the smaller limbs around it and the same with a second uh, tree right there. 15, February 26th. It's three days later, she begins to have other activity, and this goes on intensely for about a two-week period. It's just a little of what she captured. Through 25, February 26th. p.m. March 5th. March 6, 3 p.m. That's one of those crane helicopters with the crooked tail. Okay, Craig, that's all. Thanks. All right, these are just some of the things I wanted to share with you. I wish I could have included and taken when we were able to publish it uh, last year, and I hope this will help give you a little bit more idea for those of you who read the book, what the women were talking about and trying to describe. And for those of you who may read it in the future, uh, at least you'll have some point of reference now for many of the things they've talked about. Really enjoyed the opportunity to share at least these these few facts with you today, and I appreciate your attention, and we'll have questions uh, this evening.